So over the past couple of videos, I've been making planes, and more importantly, plane irons from a variety of different things. I made one out of a lawn edger blade, that did not go very well, and then I made another one out of a big two-inch chisel, and that one actually turned out great. But once you've made some irons from these sort of found items, the obvious next step is to get a piece of tool steel, shape it, and heat treat it yourself at home. So, I went online, got a piece of tool steel, and I've got about two hours until my wife gets home. I think we can squeeze that in, right? So if you're going to do this, the first thing you need to figure out is what to buy. There are basically two steels that are really good for heat treating at home with no fancy equipment. One of them is 1095, and that's what I have right here. It's just a basic high carbon steel with 0.95% carbon in it. That's what the 95 means. The other one that you can get is called O1. The O stands for oil. That's an oil quenching tool steel. Um, in addition to carbon, it's got I don't know, 11 herbs and spices in it. I don't really know what's in 01. It's a high-speed steel. Like 1095, it's very forgiving. You can be kind of outside of the exact right parameters, and as long as you get certain things correct, you're going to get a good blade out of it. And that's what really matters. The next important question is, how are we going to get our tool steel hot? And I mean like 1200, 1400 degrees hot. I'm going to use a mad gas torch. The problem with the map gas torch is that it really doesn't generate enough heat to heat up a big bar of steel like this. It's not what it's intended for. But it can be made to work if you can concentrate that heat in a certain way. What a lot of people do is build a forge or even just like a pile of fire bricks and use that to concentrate the heat. And that's obviously the best thing. I don't own a forge and I don't have any fire bricks handy, so I've got a different plan. I'm going to take this piece of steel tube here and use that to concentrate the heat of my torch. The plan is, I'm going to drill a hole through the top, and it's going to be big enough to get my torch into. Then I'm going to drill four holes around the outside edge and just wire on a piece of steel to close off one of the ends. Then I'll have a chamber that I can stick my torch into, and it should contain the heat well enough and long enough to reach the temperatures I need for heat treating. Okay, drilling this pipe did not work out. My little step bit just doesn't have what it takes to get through this hard quarter inch thick steel pipe. So, plan B. Okay, not the pristine, beautiful hole that I had pictured in my mind, but totally works. The head of the, uh, head of the torch goes right in there, and uh, project moves forward. Now, I'm going to drill some holes in the end and wire on a piece of steel to close off one side. It doesn't look like much, but here's my DIY heat treat forge. I've got the base on there to keep heat from coming out and the hole that I've cut takes the torch in and also lets me adjust the angle of the torch in a number of different ways while still being a pretty tight fit. It's not going to let a lot of heat back out through that opening. The next thing I need to do is prep my piece of tool steel. Um, while it's still in the annealed or softened state, it's a lot easier to work with. So I'm going to cut it to length, about 6 inches, and I'm also going to grind the bevel now. I could grind it after I do the hardening, but then it's just going to be a lot more time and a lot more wear and tear in my grinder for no reason. So I'm going to grind the bevel most of the way there, but not make it too thin because that steel will tend to burn during the hardening process. And as a final step, I'm going to copy the geometry from one of my existing plane irons and get the angles cut in the top of this so I can do lateral adjustment with a hammer. Okay, here we go. All 
right, here's the setup. The pipe forge is in a small machinist device. I've got that mounted on a piece of square tube because my map gas torch is gonna burn better when it's more vertical, and this is gonna get it a little more up and down. The map gas torch is inside that hole that I made. It's just inside, barely sticking out. In fact, I'm gonna pull it out a tiny bit more because I don't want the tip of the torch to melt. I've got the torch in a screw clamp, so it's held nice and securely, and I've got the whole thing mounted on a Harbor Freight welding table. So it's a pretty secure setup. Right now, I'm just test heating a railroad spike, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. I'm also burning off all the oil and dirt and everything else that's inside of this. You can see a lot of smoke still coming off of it, and there's a lot of junk that still has to cook off. I don't want any of that migrating into my steel, so a good test heat is a good idea. Now while I'm waiting for this railroad spike to get nice and warm, let's talk about safety. I'm wearing all natural fibers and leather clothes. If you wear anything synthetic and it gets hot or gets hot metal or oil on it, it can melt and stick to your skin and give you a really bad burn. So stick with cotton, wool, and leather while you're doing stuff like this. I'm wearing thick welding gloves, leather boots, and I've got a really good selection of blacksmith's tongs right over here. Now, I have these because I find them at tag sales and flea markets and stuff, but if all you have is pliers, channel locks, vice grips, any of that stuff, anything that'll grab metal and has a nice long handle, that's gonna get the job done. I'm also doing this work outside. I'm in my garage, I've cleared out a nice space, there's nothing around that's flammable. I moved the gas can outside, and I have a fire extinguisher. So I should have all my bases covered as far as safety goes. It's really important for you to think about this stuff ahead of time and take responsibility for your own safety while you're doing something like this. Okay, my railroad spike has just been in for about two minutes. The tip is already approaching red hot which is what I'm looking for. And now I'm gonna take it out and I'm gonna show you why I've got it in there. Okay, I've got my railroad spike. You can't see, but it is red hot. And now I'm gonna plunge it into my quench oil. I'm using canola oil here because it's pretty non-toxic. The oil's definitely gonna smoke and it could flash up on you. It could burst into flames for a second. So use the longest thing that you have and try to stand well away from it in case you get a little flame. If it does flame up on you, it's not a big deal. You can blow it out and it shouldn't hurt you as long as you keep your hands away from the fire. The reason that I'm quenching this is because quench oil works better when it's warm rather than cold. So by just doing a regular piece of steel and quenching that first, I've heated up my oil to a temperature where it's gonna be way more effective. Also, my quench bucket is a metal can because it's gonna get really hot. Don't use plastic for this. Plastic could melt and you could have hot oil all over the place. Okay, now that the quench oil is warm and my setup is fully tested, I'm gonna fire up my forge again and get my actual plain iron in there. When my steel gets hot enough, it's gonna stop sticking to a magnet. And that's how I'm gonna know I'm close to my quench temperature. I actually wanna be a little bit above non-magnetic. So I'm gonna keep pulling it out occasionally, checking it with the magnet, and then putting it back in again. Here's the view inside the forge. You can see the flame hitting right on that iron, heating it up exactly where we want. Now I know I'm starting to get there because we're starting to get that red, cherry red look. I'm going to keep turning the iron and pretty soon I'm going to start moving it around in the flame to make sure it's getting as even a heat as possible. Let's do a magnet check. We are just about losing magnetism. So I'm going to move it around a little bit more, check it a few more times, and then I'm going to quench it. Okay, here's the quench. Preliminary results on this iron look really good. 
If you've ever watched Rory May, the Dirty Smith, he does some great videos on heat treating and he says you really want your scale to come popping off after you do the quench. I've got that. I know that it was heated to past non-magnetic. Everything looks good right now. So I'm going to take this to the wire wheel, get all the gunk off of it, and then we're going to file test it. So if you remember a couple of videos back, I made a plane iron out of an edger blade. And it's right about here where I broke out the file that things started to get a little bit dicey. That blade didn't pass the file test. Let's see what this one does. Hmm. Not bad. Skates nicely. It's got that sort of that sort of glass-like sound on the edges. I'm not making any visible scratches. This thing looks hard. At this point, our iron is hardened and cleaned off, but it still needs to be tempered. At this point, right after hardening, the steel is actually much too hard and it's brittle, so the edge will chip really easily. What we want to do is bring that hardness down just a little bit by heating the iron up to around 400 degrees and then letting it cool off. Now for that, we can use a standard kitchen oven or a toaster oven, but not a microwave oven. Of course it's tempting just to go ahead and set your oven to 400 degrees, let it heat up, and throw your iron in. But that's actually a bad idea, and I'll show you why. Just bought this inexpensive oven thermometer this morning, and let me get in there. You can see we are only at maybe a little over 375. So my oven's internal thermostat is terrible. Standard kitchen ovens are kind of notorious for that. So let me take that up a little bit and we'll see if we can get the oven up to an actual 400 degrees. Now I've turned the oven up several times and let it come up to temperature. And now with the oven set at 430, I finally have an internal temperature of 400 degrees. And I can use that oven thermometer to make sure it actually stays at 400 throughout the tempering process. Now the iron goes into the oven. Just lay it on the grate so it won't fall. Now I'm just going to set my timer for two hours. And then I can go do something else while it tempers. That's it. Now the obvious impulse here is just to reach in the oven and yank that plain iron out right now, but from everything that I've read, that's actually not a good idea. Best thing to do is just to leave it in there, let the whole thing cool down for a couple of hours, and then pull it out. I'll show you one more thing real quick. Take another fast shot of the oven thermometer and you see here it's reading maybe 420 or 425. So the lesson we learned from this is not that my oven thermostat is so bad, it's actually pretty accurate, but that the oven is not up to temperature when it tells me it's up to temperature. So when it beeps and says I'm at 400 degrees, it's not yet. So oven's pretty accurate but I need to let it come up to temperature for maybe 20 or 25 minutes next time prior to sticking something in. I'm not really worried about that extra 25 degrees on the plain iron. I think that'll be fine. So now we're cooled down and out of the oven. And of course the problem now is, did it all work? Did it harden and temper correctly and do we have the right hardness steel for a good plain iron? Now I gave it the file test and that worked out fine, but now I want to know did the tempering work right? And luckily, the color of the steel can tell us a lot. One of the reasons that I cleaned it off is because when you heat treat bare steel, the air reacts to it and forms an oxide layer over it. And that oxide layer comes in different colors depending on what heat it forms at. So at around 400 degrees, which is the correct temperature for a tool steel, you should get a gold color. 
blacksmiths and metal workers refer to it as straw. And you can see the difference between the scale that I have over here and the clean part that got tempered. And that's a very clear sort of yellow gold color. Now I'm not sure you can see it on camera, but this front edge, especially this corner here and over here, are much more of a purple color. And that means they got tempered a little bit too much. But I was expecting that. That's why I didn't grind this bevel all the way to a fine, keen edge. I left it kind of thick to protect it against overheating. And now what I'm going to do is take it over to the grinder, grind away all of that metal that probably got overheated, expose the fresh, hardened, and tempered steel underneath. And then, just like any other plain iron, I'm going to flatten the back and hone it on the stones. Okay, this iron is done, and I'm delighted with the way it came out. It's just as good as any commercial iron that I've ever bought, and uh, it's thicker than most of the plain irons I have, so it's going to flex less, and it's going to be perfect for my upcoming project. Now, you're asking yourself, what is this iron going in? Well, I've got an upcoming build challenge with James from Wood by Wright. He and I are each going to make a low-angle plane, and we're going to release our videos on the 31st of this month. So stay tuned for that. They're going to be really interesting. And if you're subscribed to me, make sure you go over to Wood by Wright and subscribe to James's channel. It's excellent, and you'll love it. Let me also take this opportunity to welcome my newest patrons, Robert Quinn and James Boatwright. Thanks a lot, guys. Welcome aboard. And also, my patron, Barbara, has just done a fantastic series of posts on the community page about how she took one of those really cheap import woodworking benches and just turned it into a tank of woodworking. She beefed up the top, she added extensions for long boards, cubby holes, hold fasts. It's amazing. I had no idea you could take an inexpensive bench and make something so useful and solid out of it. So go to patreon.com slash Rex Kruger and click on the community page and you can read those posts. And while you're there, who knows, maybe you want to throw a couple bucks in the tip jar and support the channel that you're watching right now. And even if you don't, thanks for watching.